The following is brought to you by the Starfleet Podcast Network, SPN, The Spin. When you got to the part where you're going around, you're having the characters assemble Spock's body parts, I I had to laugh every time. <laughs> We've got to find Spock's ass. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Big J with Beyond Trek Podcast. I am here with Randy Parker, who approached me online about a fan film that he and his brother did back in 1988 when uh, fan films were, it's like the pioneering days when you were using a, a VHS camcorder, you had to do your own sound effects. Uh, there was not a lot of fancy to go behind it, but it was something that Looked like he had a lot of fun doing, and I watched it a little bit ago. And I've got to tell you, before I forget it, the thing that I think was probably one of the two funny things. One, using some of the music from the uh, soundtrack, The Living Daylights, uh, the James Bond right. movie. <laughs> that, that, uh, that, that threw me for a loop. And you'll have to tell us about Spock's ass. But <laughs> before we get there, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Uh, okay. Well, I am a lifelong Star Trek fan. Um, my brother, who's two years younger, is not as much. We did watch it together in um, the original series and first run syndication when we were, you know, in grade school. And um, I went on to, as I said, sort of lifelong fandom. So I, um, we watched the animated series was probably first run in when we were kids. And then I eventually got into the next generation after a little false start with a shaky beginning there. Mm -hmm. And and then all the Rick Berman era shows, um, except for Enterprise. That's the one I just could never get into after after trying for a season. And then all the modern era shows, all the movies. Um, I've never actually been to a full blown convention. I've been to some Comic Con type events where I've seen some of the cast. Um, but as well as being a fan of, um, you know, basically everything Star Trek, I've also dabbled on and off over the years as a writer and content creator. Um, I did have a tech career, which is how I made my living for most of my life. But on the side, I've been involved in audio drama. I've been involved in some video. And um, so Star Trek has bled into that. Um, I've done, in addition to the film we're going to talk about, I've got a couple other things I've, I've done or would like to do. And 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 also a Star Wars fan, so also some um, Star Wars fan fiction a little bit as well. But Star Trek is my number one franchise, the thing that's sort of you know closest to my heart. Can you show us the the most dangerous game poster that you've got there behind you? That's a yeah a Star yeah. Wars fan production. Yeah. So basically, I um, there's a, a classic movie called The Most Dangerous Game that's in the public domain that's been. Um, uh, it's been remade a bunch of times um, and because it's public domain, anybody can do it. So I had actually done a straight up audio drama of it in the uh, mid to late 90s. And then a few years ago, I had founded a, a short lived audio drama troupe when I was living in Sacramento called Seriously Strange Audio Theater. And so I took that script. I went back to my sort of script for the adaptation, audio, radio drama, audio drama adaptation of Most Dangerous Game. And I grafted it all like Star Wars mythology and weapons and ships and species. And um, we turned it into a Star Wars um, fan production audio drama. So that's what you're that's not what we're really here to talk about today, but that's what you're saying <laughs> behind me. <laughs> Isn't that a conflict of interest like Star Trek and Star Wars? No, they no. <laughs> like and and that's available um uh, well, at the end, I can, I'll, I'll tell you, you, you can ask, remind, ask me where everything's available and then I can sure, do absolutely. my plugs then. Yeah. So you're, you're really close to getting your uh, Star Trek badge for, I've seen every episode of series and movies. I'll have to tell you with Enterprise, I get what you're saying. That the first season is kind of rough. The second season isn't all that much better, but if you can get through the first two seasons, season three, is good in my opinion uh, season four is really good i think just about everyone has has that opinion but yeah you're about you're about a season away from it from it getting good uh which is yeah yeah i you know you know what it was it's when by the time voyager ended and i became a huge fan of voyager as it went on 
I the last thing I wanted was kind of a prequel retread. Oh, That's not yeah. what was my appetite was for, because this was for me first run at that time. You mm -hmm. know, so I had Voyager concluded they were coming on with Enterprise. And whatever reason, I am a big fan of um, uh, blanking uh, Jonathan Archer, the um, the actor. Oh, 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 uh, um, uh, oh, my God. It's from Quantum Leap. Yes. Um, yes. And it's, from um, um, Men of a Certain Age or something along those lines. My, my brain has been my, completely not working. Like, I can feel the synapses trying yeah. to fire, yeah. but it's Scott Bakula. Yeah, Scott Bakula. I'm a big <sighs> fan of his, but for whatever reason, he just sort of rubbed me the wrong way a little bit as captain and. So anyway, I never went back and gave it the full chance. And I've heard about the temporal wars and all that. So maybe someday, but we have enough other Trek right now to watch. Right. You're right. I was really excited when he was cast because that's the first thing everyone said is, oh, wow, the guy from Quantum Leap. But then seeing his portrayal as, as the captain, it just kind of, it didn't quite work. I don't think I, I wasn't. I wasn't a huge fan of the, uh, of his portrayal. And you were talking about Voyager. The thing that I liked about all the Star Trek series, T TOS, TNG, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, they were characters that you cared about, characters that you liked. On Enterprise, I just, it's tough to say who that was. I think Phlox, for sure. Um, oh, yeah. I, I didn't sure. mind Trip or Archer, you know, okay. To Paul, okay. But see, that's the thing is it's just kind of, eh, eh, eh. It, it's, it's, it's kind of this um, even plane of just okay, as opposed to the, the other, uh, the other series. But I want to talk uh about your fan film before we sure. get before we get too far away <laughs> yeah, from it, we could get, we could geek out on other Star Trek. <laughs> oh God, we could be while. here all night if yeah. you if if you let us. That's how it is with with uh, Star Trek fans. So, I see behind you, you've got the cast of your of your film, Robin, Kirk, McCoy. <laughs> That's actually Spock. Oh, that um, is Spock. The, okay. For some reason, the McCoy is now in pieces, and the Spock is better. But <laughs> that was, you know, it was a long time ago, nineteen eighty-eight. So yeah. These, guys, these have been in storage and been moved through several houses, and you know, so. Now I see Riddler and Joker. What's the one next to the Joker? You know, I, my brother and I rewatched the movie together to kind of jog our memories, and I was saying, you know, it looks like a Gorn, but that is not a Gorn. You know, because I have the reissues of these that were came out in right. like the two thousands or whatever, and there was a Gorn. So I looked it up because I was pretty sure in the back of my mind this is actually this lizard villain from Marvel, and Marvel and Mego made, which made all these DC and Star Trek action mm -hmm. figures. They did just a dabbling of Marvel, and they did do two villains: the Green Goblin and this lizard um, guy. So that's that's what that was. He's actually from Marvel. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Is when I saw him, I I didn't recognize the the character. Uh, yeah. So if he didn't have a tail, he could pass as a Gorn, at least a TOS Gorn. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> TOS Gorn. Yeah. Rip the tail right off. Well, the uh, I guess start start at the beginning. What gave you guys the idea of waking up one day and said, hey, "Let's do let's do a film and." Was it that simple and you just kind of ad lib stuff as you go along or did you have a script you all did and yeah. things like um, that? Well, there's a few questions in there. So mm -hmm. I'll back up a bit. The, I had these action figures when they came out, probably at the time they came out when the show was in syndication and also was a fan of the DC comics. So I, I had these since I was a kid, used to play with them when I was in grade school. Um, and so, I, and I had the set, there was a bridge set. And unfortunately we didn't have it by the time we made this movie, but I had the bridge set with the little twirly transporter. I don't yeah. know if you've ever seen that. Yep. Um, and in the, so in the sort of mid to late eighties, um, camcorders were not common yet, but right. we had this eccentric cleaning man who had a camcorder and kind of lent it to us. So I think we could learn how to use it and teach him. He was an immigrant mm -hmm. and so the summer before we made this, we kind of experimented with the camcorder and, and made this little kind of music video with some stop motion animation. 
And then the it was winter break of my junior year in college and my brother's freshman year in college. And um, whatever reason, we still had the camcorder and we wanted to do some sort of creative project. And so whatever lightning struck in our you know brains that, you know, let's do something with the action figures. And of course, I was a huge Star Trek fan still. And so we decided to do this story and you know so the the exact genesis of like when that light bulb went off i don't really remember um but that's kind of how it came to be it took us about a week to film and i could certainly now go like much more into the technology and its limitations and you know sort of the, the banking of um mm -hmm. but i'll pause for a second in case you have the follow-up question um i you know what i was what I was going to say was, I, I know I know it's it's probably difficult to do not only shooting but also the, the stuff after the fact because you're talking VHS. You probably don't have a whole lot of uh, a lot of the editing then was was physical. It's not like it is now where you've got digital. You can use application software like Photoshop, uh, you know, Premiere, After Effects, things like that. It sounds it sounded like a lot of the things you did were practical at the time, like you you play the music or the or the clip or whatever it is while you're there shooting. Is that right? Yeah. So basically, our the tools we had were this camcorder, VHS camcorder, and we had either whatever our home VCR was at the time, which yeah. might have been a Betamax, might have been a VHS. It doesn't really matter. And uh, so what we did is we filmed but we well so we basically i think we came up with the story and we did write out probably wrote out most of the dialogue and what we would do is we would film and then we built so the that bridge set was basically just a card table with some cardboard walls around it and then the physical props we used and the gag of them sitting on a bridge which was some project my brother had done in school <laughs> um and then the day of location shooting in the backyard, we can talk about it later. Um, so basically, we had the camcorder and we would film the scenes and we would we would record the dialogue at the same time. But uh, but that wasn't for the most part what you heard, because what we would do is later there was like a line into the um, analog line into the camcorder. So you could overdub what was there. Yeah. So we would then go back and somehow attach some sort of microphone. Um, or maybe it had a condenser mic, I don't remember. But we basically went back and recorded the dialogue over dub because then it would sound much more present and without the wind or background noise or whatever else was happening in the house. So that was how we that was how we kind of filmed. But then to get in like the scenes where we had the ship or, um, you know, that was just dubbing from some episodes I had recorded from daily syndication on the either Betamax or VHS and dubbing from the home VCR onto the um, camcorder and everything was linear. So there really was no editing in the sense. In fact, there's a there's a pot. There's a long blackout in the middle where I come on and say we're brought to you by uh, Mars bar and this, that, and the other Milky mm -hmm. Way and whatever. That was only there because we had no way to edit out. It was too long and we needed to put something there. And the other thing was we did what we didn't want to do was take the source tape, you know, that we had recorded onto and then record from it back onto say the VCR in order to be able to edit those things out. Right. Because, yeah. you know, with this analog technology, people may not realize this that are youngsters today, but Every time you do that, it would degrade. You yep. know, VHS is not even very high fidelity. It was super low fidelity to start with. So if we were to do that kind of dubbing or editing, um, um, we'd lose a whole generation of quality. So everything was done with that initial master recording. And then, of course, like the few scenes where we had um, the actual um, audio from the show as the dialogue instead of us voicing it, that was just dubbed in with the line in um, the same way we were recording our voices. So I, I think that answers yeah. the question. Yeah, and it's interesting that you bring that up. You're right, because that is something that that we had growing up is you had, we had lower, lower fidelity 
lower quality stuff usually that was more readily available and you couldn't copy a lot of things you do you're already starting at kind of a lower quality you do one copy and you're already losing a little bit uh, and so there's not a lot of room for error because when you're doing a uh, even a you know line in a dub over <clears throat> if you had to redo it now you're talking about you kind of have to redo it at exact start and stop of your first one. So really there's not a lot of takes that you can do in this stuff. It was like you have you have one take to do it. It's going to come out the way that it's going to come out pretty yeah, much. Yeah, the one the one thing we could do is rewind and re-record. So if we yeah. filmed a scene on that original master tape, we could obviously rewind and do another take. Um, but so some of the reason that like some of the scenes are not as tight as you would expect from mm -hmm. today. I mean, one is we're we were amateurs, yeah. but a lot of it was the technology, right? Because we were timing, we recorded it and then we put the dialogue in later. And um, so we couldn't get things like there's a scene where they're going to get attacked by the Klingon ship. And I think or her uh, off screen says or somebody says we're about to get hit. And then there's some music, but it's like five, at least five seconds, long seconds, maybe even longer before like the um, you see the set shake and all that. And 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 that's just because we didn't have any real way to tighten it up unless we wanted to lose that generation of quality by dubbing it to another tape. I noticed that <laughs> I thought I thought maybe that was uh, it was just me, but it's it's little things like that. And you had fun doing it which is what it, it looked like it was. And it was something you kind of did as a, as a hobby. Let's do something together and do a film. And uh, I, when you got to the part where you're going around, you're having the characters assemble Spock's body parts. I, I had to laugh every time. <laughs> We've got to find Spock's ass. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was deliberately a comedy. So some of the comedy comes from, deliberately our premise and some yeah. comes from the campiness of our acting because neither of us are actors right <laughs> my brother my brother did most of the voices i mean in fact when i later went into audio drama i tried to stay off mic as much as possible and not do any of the acting as more of a writer producer director because that's not my strength but um and so i wasn't even trying to do a kirk impression for example <laughs> and so that so it's one of the odd things well to finish that thought before i get to the odd thing but um so some of the humor is obviously just from the crudeness of the technology, from the campiness of the acting, from the deliberate humor. Mm -hmm. So it's all a kind of mix of deliberate and maybe non-deliberate humor. But watching it again or every time I see it, one of the things like I question that we did is, you know, we did try to dub in some dialogue actuality from the real series where we could. But then we're cutting back and forth between that and us doing the voices and expecting people just to buy that, right? <laughs> that is Shatner Kirk and then me, Lame Kirk. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure that's jarring. And, you know, maybe if I had to go back and do it over again, maybe we would have just done all the voices ourselves. And some of the dialogue we picked doesn't exactly fit. Like at the end, it's a uh, dialogue from where they're on the bridge and there's the banter is dialogue from an episode where Spock had gone blind and then gets his vision back. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to make it fit him dying and coming to uh which didn't you know if you pay close attention doesn't 100 percent match but it kind of matched the vibe and it was such a glad yeah. a, a great like um banter scene between them we we decided that we had it on the on our betamax recording and decided to incorporate it it was a good pick for that when i was hearing it and i said i i know this episode i can see it in my head i couldn't couldn't think of the episode title yeah. Right off the top of my head, but yes, I I definitely remember that scene and and the one you picked. Uh, what was your favorite moment in doing this film? Well, as far as the making of it, it was for sure the um, the sort of as I mentioned earlier, the kind of location shoot in the backyard. So because um, I think that is just it's fun to see them in a real these action figures in the real environment. <laughs> On and, location in the backyard. Yeah, yeah. And we had enough variety in our backyard to, you know, have some visual appeal of, of what we're, you know, the Joker's formidable tower, <laughs> the, the King barbecue pit smokestack or something. Yeah. And um, the dense jungle of the lizard man. Um, mm -hmm. 
uh, and the, that day, you know, I, I don't know that we were, I don't know if we had a real deadline on this, but I think or maybe my brother was going to be going back to school. I had a longer break because we were trying to get this done in about a week. It took mm-hmm. us probably six or seven days to do. And um, so that day in the was kind of our day to shoot in the backyard. And I don't think we could, for whatever reason, couldn't spill over to the next day. And we were running out of light at the end. And so we're fighting time, like all the things that happen on real production. Mm-hmm. And that scene at the end where there's uh, the Riddler and um, there's the sort of chase scene, quote unquote, yeah. with the Star Wars hovercraft, which I actually have uh, sitting here, um, and um, the Fisher Price bus. <laughs> so that was like right when we were losing light. And then that scene where they're be- where they beam up, like they're they're sitting there, the three of them, and one of them's holding, yeah, holding his ass or holding. They're all holding the body parts, I think, yeah. uh, except for his ass. Um, then um, that scene, it was dark, but we just happened to have this patio light that was just above. So we turned it on, just stroke of luck that it happened to match the light or look enough like daylight that um, you know we got away with that. So I'd say that was one, and I think the other was the transporter effect. So we. If you notice the way we filmed that, we had, um, and and just as a footnote, there's one, I think it's that scene. It's either that scene or another scene where you can see the top of the the border or the top of the set. Yeah. And I think that snafu, which is, or, or a flub, which is kind of funny, is because the way it was framed in the camera, you couldn't see it, but then somehow the way it plays back on a VCR, it was a little bit wider. Oh, aspect. okay. Yeah. So, um, but uh, the way we did that transporter scene, of course, we had the little toilet paper tubes up above um, as the def- you know, transporter. I don't know what those are actually called. <laughs> Star Trek like the, the transporter buffers or yeah. something like that. Yeah, I yeah. thought the buffer was the memory that they store you The in. buffer's the memory, so, yeah. What, yeah, yeah. I don't what know if those the, have a name. The name of the actual name. thing I'm that's I'm sure above if we you. like broke out a Star Trek technical manual. It's in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> but... Um, so the um we had those um and then we had the little i think um color paper circular cutouts for the pads you stand on Mm -hmm. but then when we go to transport we zoom in so all you have is the black background behind and then we use like i think we just did a blur in the camera and then we reversed it on the other way and that's why you don't see the um the top or the bottom because we had to have just black for it to work Mm -hmm. But that effect, I think, actually works. That's probably the one thing that looks pretty good in the the film is it does kind of look like you beam out or in. (laughs) It does. Yeah. You guys did good with that effect. When I was when I was watching it, I was uh, saying that to myself, too, right before is, okay. how are they going to do this transporter effect? Because you you hear it starting up and the blur was was a good idea. I thought there were going to be like some sprinkles coming in or, or something like that. But yeah. Yeah, that was a that was a good call to do that. So you didn't have you didn't have a Batman figure. You had to go with Robin as the first officer. It didn't have one at the time. I don't think I'm not sure if. Yeah, I'm not, I probably did. I probably had one, but not by the time we when I was a kid, but not by right. the time we made this. And the other thing was Spock, um, for whatever reason, he must have broken these Mego action figures had rubber bands inside that kind of held everything. Oh, together. yeah, those. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if they broke, all well, the pieces kind of fell out. Yeah. So that was, I think, part of the genesis of the idea was he was broken. And then <laughs> at the end, when he's put back together with the jigsaw technique mm-hmm. by uh, Green Arrow, um, Oliver um, and Dr. McCoy, um, that was he's wearing a Shazam costume. That's what that was. I th- and, okay, I knew that costume looked familiar. I did. I could. I wanted to so say we, Shazam, and I said, "No, that yeah. can't be." So I okay. must have had a Shazam action figure, and we <laughs> stuck the Spock head on it. Now I don't. Oh, I think I know what it is. So you see Spock's back in uniform here. Mm-hmm. We must have had just one of the blue uniforms by that point, since Spock had broken. So we couldn't have. So right now he's in probably what was McCoy's costume at the time. Okay, I actually have the. I think I looked at my box. I think McCoy's in there, but he's broken now. Yeah. So I think basically that's why we couldn't have him in a blue uniform as we didn't have one, but we, <laughs> these weird Shazam PJs 
And that's why just with no explanation, he's in this recovery costume or whatever from his surgery. We're on a limited budget here, people. Make it work. <laughs> it's what we had on hand. I mean, you couldn't go buy these action figures anymore at that point, unless maybe you went to a collectible store. And it was before they were reissued, you know, by another company. Yeah, I remember those. I think I had some of those ones where they were they were held together by rubber bands. And you're right, you, you lose one of them and it's like half the body just kind of falls apart. There wasn't a whole lot holding it together. Yeah, and other than the Klingon character, I didn't have any other villains. I think there were a few others they had issued at that time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, since then, I, you know, as I said, in the 2000s uh, or maybe it's the 2010s, whenever it was, another company, I can't remember their name, reissued all those Mego ones. They made some slight tweaks. So I have all those on display with a full cast of villains and the Uhura and people you don't see in our movie, like in my office. If I were to make another one of these, I've got the full cast now. Mm -hmm. But back then, it was whatever was in the box in our basement you know, of our leftover Mego action figures. You had the video, it was in three parts on YouTube because that was back when you couldn't, uh, you couldn't have one video that was that right. was that long. That's yeah. how far back we're going, guys, in YouTube. There was a time where you couldn't even upload that long of a, of a video. And there were, there were a lot of views that you got on this. So do you remember, once you uploaded it, I know it was, uh, was it seven years ago it said it was uploaded or was it nine? I remember it was seven minutes. Yeah, nine, it was there, a so. more recent on Vimeo where I had put the full length film. And the reason I didn't do that on YouTube is because then we'd lose the view history of those originals. Or, yes. or if I had them both, they might penalize you for duplicate content. There's going to be SEO voodoo with all that. Um, you know, I... When I've looked, I have not been impressed by the number of views. Do you remember like how many maybe the first one had? Because it would be drop off on the second and third. The first one had a, a 13.5 thousand. And then the uh, second and third had about a, a thousand and a half each. OK, I'll, I'll have to look at that again because I don't remember the number being nearly that high when I had last um, checked it. Uh, my brother and I rewatched it on Vimeo since it was all on one piece. Um, so, you know, I didn't get, I did, even when I uploaded it, you were still a drop in the bucket on YouTube. And I think I probably posted to, it was before Facebook fan groups and all these other, a lot of places today you could plug in. Mm -hmm. So I probably found some discussion boards or something where I, I posted that it was up and a um, you know, a, a few, whatever the kind of obvious ways you could promote at the time, but there weren't as many avenues as today. Although even today, there's so much competition, who knows, you know, if it'd be maybe be even harder to get attention. Yeah. So I think those views probably accumulated over time. It wasn't like when I put it up, we got any reaction I can remember, or it's not like there's even been a trickle. You know, I've done other stuff in, uh, since then in more recent years of publishing content on YouTube. It is hard to get views. It is hard to get comments. It is, you know, it, it's you have to be like sort of a full time social media manager to really try to get that stuff going. You do. It really is difficult because it just there are so many people doing these things. There are so many bloggers, so many podcasters, so many fan films. It's just it, it's so uh, there. there's so much of it that you're right. It's it feels like it can be very daunting to try to get uh, to get noticed. And uh, I know a lot of people will say, well, they do something for the fun of it. Yeah, sure. I get that. But if you're going to do it, you'd like for people to see it. Uh, and you you put the stuff out and it's almost it's almost like you have to have a full time job doing social media when it doesn't pay. So you have to have a full time job to support the full time job you've got to do to try to get, you know, to get that stuff. And it's is just it's very tough. I can I can tell you that for sure, because uh, there was there was a time where there was less content out there. There was less official Star Trek. There were less fan films going on. Uh, and if you if you hit that gap in content where there wasn't a whole lot of official Star Trek, you were uh, you were getting some lightning in the bottle there. But now it's just there's it, it's like you just want to try to carve your own little wedge of of stuff in there to do something that 
you hope people will see and like because there there's there's another way to do it like you've you've just you've got to throw your hat in the ring and do that uh has that has anything like that kept you from wanting to do another one has that ever been a thought of i want to do another fan film now but there's there's just so much out there that it seems like uh is it even worth the time i'll i'll answer that in two parts okay so first just follow up to uh what you were saying is yeah in addition to everything you were saying there's also the vague algorithm you've got to deal with with yeah. um, youtube because they really reward like um frequent publication of content you have to be like constantly churning out for them to and then get engagement on your videos so you know i was um the more recently had published uh during the pandemic an improvised sketch comedy show where we would improvise um sketch we'd work out the idea ahead of time of what the premise was going to be and we would do kind of a brief rehearsal to well, I'm going into too much detail, but basically it was an improvised sketch comedy show and we'd put it up on YouTube about we published it either every week or two weeks and we did three seasons and that was not enough. Like we promoted every way we could. It was just hard to get eyeballs. So in that sense, we had a great time doing it. So it was fun. It was worth doing it just to do it because it, it was all you know, actors, amateur actors who, you know, are trying to become professional. And I had my director kind of writer creative hat on and producer hat. And I did got into video editing. So it was all great fun for those things, but it didn't have that reward. It was called sound sketchy. I'll tell people how to find it later, but um, it didn't have that gratification of getting the audience engagement, you know, sure. Some friends and what family or whatever might watch, but um, that is a bit of a frustration. As far as doing another um, fan film, what's stopping me now is I do have another one. It's not this type. Mm. <laughs> it's actually a, a 40 minute or a 40 page script. I could get cut down, but it's a 40 page script that is a parody of the original series. And um, it's something uh, it got uh, the original version of it was a 10 minute audio comedy I had done in probably the late 90s with mm -hmm. our radio drama troupe I was involved with at the time. And I later, about five years ago, expanded that out from a much shorter premise to more like a full episode um, that's uh, a satire parody of the original series. And I know it could be done with the Neutral Zone studio sets or the Warp 60, uh, was it Warp 66? Warp 66. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so... I know this could be done, but it would be such a big undertaking. Those sets, I'm in California. Those sets are like very remote from me, you know, assembling a team, um, uh, figuring out the budget and the acting. And, you know, there's, I mean, the, act, the cast, there's, you know, I've watched a wide variety of fan films. And if I did this, I kind of want to do it right on the higher end of the production quality and the acting. So it would not be any casual undertaking, especially since it's not a low, those sets are not local to me. So I do have that project that's still kind of on my bucket list that at some point uh -huh. when I have the uh, life bandwidth, I may want to undertake that's live action in case that wasn't clear. Um, so I would like to make another one and make a more uh, proper modern era fan film. Um, uh, so I, I wouldn't what's stopping me isn't necessarily get I think that one could draw an audience, um, but that's not stopping me as the challenge of getting an audience. It's more the ambition of the project. You're right. And that's uh, hopefully that turns out that, that works out because you're right. Being in California now, I, I only know of um, uh, Warp 66, Neutral Zone Studios, Ticonderoga, but that's more of like a museum set right. tour kind of thing. I, I don't, yeah. I don't believe there's I don't think uh, they film there anymore. Right, right. I, I don't believe there's any any filming there anymore. Uh, and there's, and then you've got folks that have like their their personal studios that yeah. they that they make. Um, there's a, a gentleman who uh, I'm sure you're, uh, whose name you've you've seen in the fan films, Frank Parker Jr. He's got a, a real nice setup that he has in his uh, mother-in-law's garage. Looks spectacular. So you've you've got you've got these these people that have uh, like those the big studios and the in the set. So they're out there. 
Uh, but you're right. It's a matter of just the the logistics of getting getting people together, uh, getting schedules aligned because it's it's more of a it's something you do something you do on your free time. So it's not like there's a lot of uh, hey, I can do it on the weekend or this weekend. You know, there's this one day this month I'm I'm available, and that has to be that has to be a real pain in the butt uh, to to do that because yeah, I've. I would love to do a, a do a fan film and be on one of the studios, but uh, I, I know that for cause there's there's one that that I'm working on writing and, and want to do, but it's going to be more of a uh, sit in, in front of the camera with a green screen behind you, uh, which is which is what's done a lot of the times. They do what's called com boxes. Uh, it's when you're you know, you, you do your thing, you do your talking and uh, you get put on like a like a communication box that's that's like edited in there uh, or, you know, swapping back and forth. So there's there's a lot of ways to do it. But that does sound pretty ambitious anytime you want to do an actual uh, on location kind of thing. So hopefully that comes to fruition for you. Yeah, I think what's super exciting about fan films these days, well, of course, there's so many different ways to do them. And I just wa I had watched you and uh, Jonathan Lane and um, uh, Josh Irwin. Your, Josh, yeah, Josh. And I forget the fourth guy's name. I uh, watched Cheeto, your, Cheeto from yeah, Cheeto. Uh, Nerd yeah, he's Two. Only, yeah. yeah. Um, so I watched your 2023 fan film and review because I used to follow these pretty closely, mm -hmm. especially back in the era of like Star Trek Continues and Phase Two and uh, yeah. Farragut and all that. And I've dabbled since, but I'd, I almost became overwhelmed with how many were coming out now. So I kind of tuned out the last year, but that was super helpful to kind of catch up. Um, that's on YouTube. Uh, on this channel and I think on others, right? Yes. Um, yeah, we, we put that, um, I put that on, on my channel on Beyond Trek Podcast. Yeah. It's also on uh, a channel called No Budget Productions. Uh, Nerd2 put it on their channel. Yeah. Uh, so we had it on a, a few different channels. Yeah. Uh, Josh put it on the Avalon Universe channel. So we put that on several yeah. YouTube channels of ours. Um, and uh, of course, in the different Facebook groups. And so, yeah, you, you know, it's, it's trying to get it out there uh, so that people can see these things. And so, and it must have worked because you saw it. Yeah. So uh, to continue my thought, it, um, so that was great because it, it gave me a bunch to watch that I had heard of, but hadn't pursued. And one of them was the zoom one that um, was, wasn't actually filmed in the pandemic, I guess, I guess he conceived it in the pandemic, but then still did it that way even afterwards. Um, so I, I think the that the number of ways you can make them is encouraging. But for me, what's most exciting is those practical sets mm -hmm. because you can make a fan film that basically looks every bit as good and maybe better than the original series, right? Because the film making the sets are of high fidelity, at least the way they appear on screen, and the film technology has obviously improved a lot. And I don't know who does all these VFX, but a lot of these are pretty decent VFX. So you really can, as a fan filmmaker, compared to what we made with Miko action figures, make something that is very high quality, um, you know, getting the acting that matches is sometimes a challenge and um, not everyone's trying to, you know, a lot of people are just out there having fun. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what's exciting to me is like that prospect that you could make something that looks like it's, it looks like it's, you know, uh, a a an actual episode. And I watched that one. Uh, it's called Three Five Nine, and it's uh, it was a very interesting way how it was put together. It was different. It was it was handled like it was a Zoom call kind of thing. Now it's not not to say that that means it's a comedy. It's not. It's just no. that the way that they did it was uh, it, it looked like there's a lot of kind of a conference call looking thing. I mean, you you had. Uh, you know, your your row of, of people you'd see talking to the main person and they'd kind of swamp back and forth. If you haven't seen that one, it's I would recommend it. That's a that's a good one. And there are so many good fan films out there and there are so many. And it just it, it ranges from going outside with your, your cell phone and, you know, uh, having a, a T-shirt on or uniform or something and up as high as. Uh, ones that look like they're 
studio quality type films. And there's such a big range in there. And you come to realize that anybody can do these fan films now. It's not like it was where uh, I, I guess a lot of people may have may have felt that, well, how, how would I even do this? I don't have a I don't have a nice camera. I don't have you know large rigs, actors, things like that. And folks, it's not it's not that high tech. I mean, you can you can make it as small as you want it to be or as big as you want it to be. For wouldn't, sure. wouldn't you agree? Yeah. yeah. And also it's being done all over the world. Like the, oh, yeah. there's one from a couple years ago from a Czech team that had released their first one that was TNG era. I don't I don't have all the I have a list of these somewhere. I don't have all the titles memorized. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, and Germ I've Star Trek speak in Germany, so there's some coming out of there as well. So it's it's a pretty vibrant community. The uh, CBS fan film guidelines that were supposed to kill fan film certainly did, did not. And uh, it's great to see that, you know, if anything, it's it's constantly growing. And it, it should be. We certainly wish that CBS would be to Star Trek fan films the way that Lucasfilm is to Star Wars fan films. Uh, on the Star Wars side, it's totally embraced in regards to those fan films. CBS, they're they're looking for people they can shut down. It, it's like their their main thing. If you if you do something that's too good, they're going to find you. They're going to shut it down. There was this uh, this set, this uh, TNG recreation set that was that was done so well that they got a cease and desist mm. on on that. And it, it's I've I've had talks about this uh, several times, different discussions is that it it can be it can be kind of discouraging when you want to do something good and to know that if you do too good, then you're going to be uh, you're going to have a, a you know crosshairs on your back. You're going to have a target on your back because the uh, uh, you know the VIP holder CBS they they do not want to have any attention taken away from them, not even the smallest bit, uh, which is a shame. You know, you're you're not you're not trying to uh, to encourage creativity or collaboration. I mean, people are doing it, but they're doing it knowing in the back of their head that. You know, it's we're not we're not being treated as well as as supposed to do the Star Wars fan films. And it's it's a real shame. I uh, don't know if that's ever going to change. Probably have yeah. to assume it's it's not. It's hard to say. I mean, who's going to eventually own Paramount anyway is up in the air right now. So you know True. what will ha happen. The one thing if I ever did do that parody I was talking about, that'll be an interesting choice is because it's parody. We would not necessarily have to adhere to fan film guidelines. Like it'd probably be safer to adhere to them, but yeah. it, it it it's a, a little more flexible if you're it's fair use if you're doing parody. Although they can still probably nitpick like certain things oh, you know, yeah. if you go down that road. Yeah, a parody is probably going to to be a safer bet. You're right. Uh, do you have? I want to ask this kind of stepping away from the from the fan film part of it. Do you have a favorite Star Trek series? Yeah, I think you said it was Voyager, right? No, Voyager isn't the favorite. I just mentioned it as an example. Okay, what's the favorite? Um, I mean, it is like asking who's your favorite child, but... Um, sure, yeah. <laughs> it, so the way... I usually give a complicated answer. I say in some ways I have to say TOS because it was my first, mm -hmm. you know, grew up with the, that show and the movies. But, I mean, I'd say that um, TNG, Next Generation, you know, is also just about as close to my heart and obviously it was much longer. There's a lot more, at least as far as the show, there's a lot more content. Um, and then with the story continuing, even with Picard and hopefully eventually legacy. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but then sometimes I'll say, if you want to know what the best is, the best is Deep Space Nine, only in the sense of the deep roster of characters and the consistency of the show. I don't name it as my favorite, like in my heart, in my head, I could say you could argue it's the best, at least of the original era shows the modern era shows would be a whole nother discussion. Um, but so I usually will say TOS or TNG or say it's kind of a tie is how I usually answer that. DS9 would have to be the one for me. And for one of the reasons you mentioned is because it had such a deep roster of 
characters and they were able to do something with everybody. And I think that that was just amazing how they, there were so many parts in that series, so many characters and so many different arcs. Uh, uh, and sure, I, I certainly like TNG. If we're going to talk about the, um, uh, I guess the, what would we want to call that era? TOS, TNG. Berman, the, yeah, Rick, the, Berm, Rick Berman era. Sure, the Berman era, and, and now we're in what, the Kurtzman or era? 24, or 24th New century Trek. era. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so DS9 for me was the one. Going into the uh, this New Trek era, Mm. That's tough because I I certainly like Picard. I like Strange New Worlds. I I thought I think Discovery is is not bad. Uh it, tough first season. Second season I think started to, to turn it around. Yeah. Uh, I I can definitely tell you I could I'd be fine if they just stopped doing lower decks. Just not a not a big fan of that one. So I would say between Strange New Worlds and Picard, it's it's a uh, it's a toss up there. They're both, they're yeah. both very good. My take is that um, all of the shows, most of the shows, are kind of mixed, and I would agree. Like Discovery, to me, the pilot or the maybe second episode should have ended with them jumping a thousand years, which they did at the end of season two. We wouldn't have gotten Strange New Worlds, so that would have been unfortunate, mm -hmm. but. But I think that show didn't really become what it should have been because, who, again, who wanted another prequel and one that was going to rewrite canon? You know, I mean, that yeah. didn't bother me as much as some other purists, but like still, you know, Spock didn't need to have a sister, all that stuff. Right. So, like, right. I think that show really should have been set in the far future from the start. And that those first two seasons, they improved as they went along, but, you know, kind of shaky like some other Star Trek shows were, like, uh, especially TNG, it's for a season and two. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think Picard really, I think I enjoyed one and two seasons, one and two immensely, but I think really three was the slam dunk for that show. And um, Strange New Worlds, just because of its format, is kind of hit or miss week to week, but I, I, I love the show. But I would say, and Lower Decks, I, I like Lower Decks. I, I do enjoy it. But I would say, actually, if there's one that's the clear cut, consistent, on quality, good from the start winner, it's actually Prodigy. And I didn't expect really? that from, yeah, I didn't expect it from, you know, what its original target o audience was, but I think it's beautifully animated. I love the story, uh, the characters, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm all in on, on Prodigy. I take it you're not. No, I like it. I like Prodigy. I'm, I'm just surprised that it ranks up there so high for you as this would be pretty close to a favorite of this, of the new Trek era. I really like I, I like them all because I love Trek and each of them has its yeah. aspects. But I think if you just look objectively at sort of consistency of mm -hmm. the, you know, kind of like with the Deep Space Nine argument that Prodigy is the most consistent so far. OK, OK, I think I could I could get behind that. Yeah. What other hobbies do you have besides Star Trek? I know we tend to think we live in the world of Star Trek, but <laughs> I looked at your site. You do some some blocking, some other tech writing yeah. and, uh, and and things like that. And it looks like that's another thing you keep fairly busy with is the is the tech blogging. So how's that been going for you? So the blogging. So I actually retired from a software engineering career in 2018 and um I had been in web development and then managing software engineers. And so I didn't want to, I never really loved programming. You know, I got good enough at it, um, but I wanted to still, I still liked publishing content. So I learned, I learned WordPress, which I had not used really before. And that enabled me to like, it's easy for me technically because of my background, but I don't have to do any coding and I could really focus more on the look and the, the you know, actual content. So blogging, I just sort of blogged about a mismatch of things. It was a lot of financial stuff at the beginning because I had just retired early retirement and financial independence movement. I did actually a post that uh, compared the financial independent movement to Star Trek. That's one of my two Star Trek posts. The other one's about how I introduced my kids to Star Trek. Um, and then more lately, it's been uh, 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 more tech, you know, tech articles, how to's or mm -hmm. um uh, things like that. Um, so 
I haven't been blogging as much recently, but it was a way to get back into writing, get into WordPress. I'll just blog now or post if there's something. There's a couple of posts I maintain, two or three um, to keep up to date, but I just kind of post if lightning strikes and I have an idea that really hits. It's It was similar uh, to what we were talking about with YouTube, though, trying to get a lot of eyeballs on mm. your posts. Unless you're going to do the social media, unless you're going to publish multiple times a week, it's kind of hard to build the audience. So. Uh, the, some of the niche posts, posts I've done that are on very specific topics, those are the ones that get the most traffic. And that's what you often hear because people are looking for something very specific and you tend end up being a high match for that. Um, and then I enjoy many other fandoms. You know, I do enjoy Star Wars. I'm a huge Walking Dead fan, which surprises me because I wasn't into zombies when I started watching it. And then it's it's maybe my number two franchise or up there on the top five after uh, Star Trek. Mm -hmm. um, so many other kind of sci-fi fantasy fandoms and, you know, some comedy I like a lot as well. And then, as I mentioned, I've dabbled on and off as a content creator. So audio, what used to be called radio drama and is now called audio theater, uh, this um uh, the Zoom uh, pod, uh, the Zoom uh, improv show I mentioned. Um, I've been kind of in a creative dormant period the last year or so because of some life transition, moving from Northern California to Southern California and some other things. But I'm now going to start to have bandwidth again to figure out kind of what I want to do next creatively. Um, and then I've gotten into I've, I've gotten into pickleball since I moved to Southern California. So that's now two or three times a week, totally addicted, like you hear everybody uh, talking about. Uh, like to exercise in the outdoors. So, you know, there's a bunch of a bunch of different kind of hobbies and interests. I know I've heard pickleball, but I'm drawing a blank on what it is and what you do. It, it, people say it's kind of a cross between tennis and ping pong. It uses half of a tennis court and you use a wiffle ball and you have paddles and you usually play doubles, but you can play singles. And it's much easier than tennis. And it's I've played almost every paddle or racket sport. I think it's the most fun one I've, yeah. I've ever played. Um, but it's it's become this craze like the last five years. And um, uh, so you'll start hearing you'll start seeing references to it all the time now that I've mentioned it. <laughs> yes, that's how it always works. Uh, there's probably going to be next time I open up my web browser and it's going to show like recommended articles and things like that. Suddenly there will be a pickleball set <laughs> there. Yeah. Like I, I've never searched for it. I don't know how Google know, knows that I was talking about it or whatnot. Yeah. And I've had crazy things like that happen. There was this day at work. I was looking at this piece of equipment that uh, one of my coworkers had. I was just looking at it. Didn't Google it. Didn't search it. Nothing. We're just looking at it, talking about it. I go back to my desk a little, little bit later and uh, my, my homepage is... Uh, I think it's uh, MSN.com or something. It's right. just got all the different new stuff. One of the suggested like shopping items was was that was that thing. And I I, I so weird. messaged my uh, uh, my manager. I said I'm scared. Like it, it's suggesting I get this yeah. thing that I was over there talking about and looking at, and it's just it is it's it's very very strange. So if I see any suggestions for something pickleball, I'm going to have to let you know like oh my god, if somebody's listening, maybe it's the FBI or something like that. Or if somebody analyzes the transcript of this when it goes up and <laughs> and here's pickleball, who knows? Who True. knows how it gets Probably out there. Probably pickleball sales just skyrocket. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people a lot of people think Siri or Alexa are listening to us. I mean, you know, when they shouldn't be. I, I don't know about that, but somehow it gets it gets into their algorithm. Oh, I've I've had my Alexa just suddenly start talking. Oh, yeah. My Alexa told me a Star Trek joke the other day. You know, once in a while that offers jokes and uh -huh. I don't remember how it picked up the Star Trek context. Um, maybe I asked if someone was in. I think I asked, like, was so and so in the show or whatever. And it must have been Star Trek. And, and that was when I decided for sure I already was getting this impression from using um, uh, Alexa more. But at that point, I knew for sure I like Alexa so much more than Siri. <laughs> the, Way more personality. If Alexa is going to tell me a Star Trek joke, something's right. <laughs> the other day I was I was in bed and uh, all the lights were off. And I'm just on the on the phone looking at Instagram, things like that. And out of nowhere, Alexa says, OK. And the bedroom light turns on. So what the f how did that happen? Who who did that? And I know that, you know, nobody like knows the name of what I named the lights. It was just strange. 
Yeah. You know, that's yeah, why so I have a, I have Alexa enabled to turn on just the light in the room I'm in, but not my alarm or anything else. <laughs> yeah, she'll do some crazy stuff. So the name of your film is The Search for Spock's Body Parts. That's right. And you can look that up on YouTube. Anyone who wants to see this, I definitely recommend watching it. It's a nice, fun little film, The Search for Spock's Body Parts. And, and if I could, um, could I mention oh, yeah. um, my uh, domain just because it has the pointers to everything else? Yeah, yeah. anything you want so to So if you want to learn anything more about anything I, I've, I'm doing or I've done, it's all at emusements.com. So it's E-M-U-S-E-M-E-N-T-S dot com. Um, and that's just my personal, it was something else once upon a time, but now it's just my personal uh, blog and uh, website and portfolio. So it has links to some of the things I mentioned, the um, the different uh, audio drama shows I've been involved in, the uh, Sound Sketchy, which was the YouTube improv show, my Star Trek blog posts. There, that uh, Star Trek audio parody I did um, with what was called um, a group called Shoestring Radio Theater in San Francisco, that's actually on there also, if you go to the audio drama section, is called uh, Captain's Log Accidental. And uh, so if you want to hear a different Star Trek uh, parody I did, um, you can listen to that one. And that's what I expanded into this uh, script, which is now called A Head Warp Factor 11, which is the one I may, may make as a fan film someday. I hope you do. That would definitely be awesome if you did that. So that's emusements.com. Right. And I'm going to have the the link uh, down below us when I when I do the videos. So emusements.com is where you can find Randy Parker and uh, we can find you on uh, Facebook, of course, on, on social media. So there's a lot of good ways to uh, to find you and your work and, and whatnot. Uh, Randy, I really appreciate you taking the time out uh, to sit with me. Was was there anything else you wanted to mention, bring up, talk about before we before we wrap up? No, I, I think we pretty much covered it all. It was a, a lot of fun and a, a great discussion. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, well, I'm I'm glad you did. I did as well. Uh, thanks for finding me on Facebook. Thanks for watching the fan film year in review that we did, and uh, certainly look forward to seeing if you. Do uh, the, end up taking these other ideas, these film ideas you have and turning them into fruition. So good luck to you. I hope it happens. And to our audience that are here listening and watching with us, live long and prosper. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can support us at patreon.com slash beyond Trek. We are Beyond Trek Podcast. Lower your inhibitions and surrender your years. We will add inspirational and hilarious Trek content to your day. Your attention will adapt to subscribe to us. Resistance is futile.